we got dropped, I got another deal. And then I started working on the on uh, Thelonious Punk. And to be honest with you, that that thing went on for like five years because I didn't know what I was doing. I tried to produce it myself and I didn't know how to produce. Um, I kind of knew how to produce, but not really fully. And um, yeah, and you know, I, and I wasn't, I really wasn't work, working hard. And I was working on these songs and I had a, a few, like ended up having like maybe nine or 10 songs. And it was really on, it was actually sitting on the shelf. That album was sitting on the shelf for like three years. And it wasn't until uh, I was in the ludicrous video that <laughs> Delicious Vinyl decided that it was the right time to put it out because there was a lot of exposure uh, in with that video because it was ludicrous and it was you know on MTV and they were like oh let's so then they kind of like pulled my album off the shelf and and dusted it off and added a few more songs <laughs> and then put it out. But, and... but 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 like what's up, Fat Lip being in single that shit came out in two thousand. The album didn't come out in 2005. Oh, I remember. But, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> it was years, years later, as they yeah. say. I had a lot of time on my hand back then. Yeah. yeah exactly. And uh, uh, looking back, like, how did that period of, of drug use and stuff, how did you move past it? How did you advance? Um, Just, you know, I, you know, I want to say something. The drug use, like... The drug use wasn't really a thing so much, like not really. Like I don't think as much as people think it is. Like, I, I can I just take this moment right now and just say that I've never once in my life smoked crack. Okay, and that's the truth. So, but but um, but no, there was just a lot of drug use, a lot of drinking, and like in retrospect, I have to say that. Um, it's 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 difficult to manage yourself as an artist, like when you don't have a like a nine to five, but you still have ways of making money. You can you have to manage yourself, or you're you're just gonna just be out of control. And and I wasted a lot of time, like you know, not managing myself, not writing lyrics every day, just uh, you know, a bunch of shit. What was the question though? I, I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to know how you were able you to make get your way back. Yeah, how did you get past um, it? I stopped drinking. I stopped drinking and I started taking my craft a, a more serious. I would, this is what I like to say. There was a period where myself and Jay Swift, we had what, what, I, what I personally call, coined the Jim Morrison complex. It's when you think that being a, a tortured soul artist was is is how the only way that to be a good artist like like a lot of times I, I i used to think i used to look at artists like jim morrison and jim uh jimmy hendrix and shit even old dirty bastard and be like yo i want to be like that prince michael jackson james brown miles davis keep going down the line they all that is a part of it but you don't have to be that way <laughs> But some of the best ones do have that thing about them. Prince? Mm. Yes. 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 Yeah, he comes from a tortured soul from a home who father hates him. You never heard the the the, the you prank hear call. That phone the call. That's it was father. funny. Come on, bro. His father <laughs> ah. hates everything about him. Oh man, it was funny as hell. Well, I mean, so I used And so... then he died of drug of a drug use. Hmm. I mean, so I yeah I would I I romanticize about being that being that tortured like you know Kurt Cobain on drugs and shit like that and I wasn't even on drugs like that but I I I wanted all of that I would just wanted that vibe and then when I realized you could actually be creative and make money and and enjoy your life as an artist without all of that then things changed for me. So why do you think? that was romanticized to you because like Imani said all the coolest artists kind of go through that and like seriously like you know uh the loneliest funk John Coltrane they that's what they show you shit yeah that's but if we look if we look at rap if we look at rap like LL Cool J KRS1 Chuck D Ice Cube they're not cool what? Yo, yo hold they, up. They they, they oh, left wait, hold the on, hold on. time, well, and they were cool in their day. 
But as an, as a youngster coming up looking at that, that's not who you're looking up to. You're looking at Lil Wayne. Oh, you mean later? I'll say this. Yeah. I'll say this. The the only person who broke that that mindset for me, well, there were two people, Jay Z and Kanye. Okay. Jay Z and Kanye are cool. They're cool, and they continue to um, like build businesses. No, they're still here. Yeah, they're hip. Hot music. Yeah, they still got some hip and they hop. The, and, and and yeah, and I, and I and I started to, yeah, like like somewhere around the Watch the Throne album when I went to the concert and I saw them like create this entire movement be, uh, behind their art, but also monetizing it in the most professional manner and people are coming to the shows and enjoying it and and they handle their business. Like that was around 2011 or some shit like that. Up until then, I was a wreck. <laughs> you know? Okay, <laughs> but I, but also, I mean, also like I I I I'm a self help kind of guy. I I seek out information to always try to better myself, and you know I've maybe read some philosophies that you know talk about balance and and things like that, and you know maybe that played a part in it too. But, but I kind of just Alan Watts balance. or something, some Alan Watts, <laughs> you know. Hmm. So yeah. I'm just uh, a little shocked because just that someone like uh, LL or Karis One or Ice Cube or Scarface. Mine said that. I didn't say that. I didn't say I didn't that either. LL wasn't cool. That nigga's name is cool. That's what I was. <laughs> oh, that's what, it's, it's in the name. LL yeah. Cool J is very cool. <laughs> you know. But but there was. Like for instance, there were I think there were like these these rules that you you or these boundaries or these like I remember you couldn't be you couldn't be a, a rapper and a dope and a and an actor at one point. You can't okay. remember, that. You both. remember that. Well I remember you couldn't even get an endorsement back in the day without selling out, quote unquote. Right. Yeah, for sure. Because everybody knew where it was gonna lead to. Because once you let the genie out the shit, you can't stop all the bad shit that comes out with the genie, genie also. So that's why they be saying, don't start that shit. Because once you start it, you can't stop it. So yeah, it, it's a double-edged sword. So yeah, good shit comes out, but bad shit comes out too. It's like the internet or anything else. So you got to just deal with it and learn how to deal with shit. So Amani, I have a question. With uh, LL Cool J, Karis One, Ice Cube, Scarface, people like, how are they Those not- are the people that we looked up to. Yeah, so how are they not cool or people that... They're, no, 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 I'm saying they're not cool to the young kids now. I'm saying the kids now are looking up to the Lil Wayne's. But what I'm yeah. saying is that's just rap. When you're a rapper, you're not just influenced by people who, who make rap music. You're influenced by dignitaries. I mean, uh, artists, <laughs> just, actors. You're... So so when you're seeing other people, and excess is an American thing. So it's not just a rap thing. So if you're seeing excess or anything, so if you see somebody... Drinking and they doing it in excess is American thing. Richard Pryor, like you said, he running down the street on fire. That's like one of our heroes and shit. So we wasn't just affected by LL Cool J. And just because LL Cool J didn't smoke, that didn't mean I didn't smoke weed. That's what he do. You feel me? So I mean, I'm not like following behind nobody because LL Cool J didn't smoke, so I'm not gonna smoke. So I mean, that's cool. I blaze, nigga. I smoke hella weed, right? And and I'm not trying to be like, oh, do what I do, or I'm not trying to do what somebody else do, but I'm gonna do me. So that's the dope shit. Do you. So if doing drugs is your thing, more power to you. The end result is what, what I'm listening to. Because I don't really care about your lifestyle, what you do. I want to hear what comes out the speakers, right? And at some point, you got to separate your real life and whatever. If it, you know, that's cool if you want to get into the, a person, be a fanboy, whatever. I'm just here for the music, dog. I'm here for the music. Whatever you do, if you want to be a Christian, you want to be a homosexual, you want to do drugs, more power to you, homie. I want to hear what's out. I'm here for the music. You feel me? So I'm, this ain't school. This ain't moral school. This ain't like uh, Sunday school. I'm not here for all that. Like everybody lives their life a different way, but I'm here for the art, right? And mm-hmm. artists do all kind of weirdo shit, right? Um, uh, um, actors, paint, painters, you know what I'm feeling me? So I, whatever you do on off time, more power to you, right? And we're influenced by all kind of shit. But the main thing we're influenced by is the is America, right? And what goes on in America. So we're influenced by all kind of shit, right? Mm-hmm. But LL Cool J is not who I'm following, but by his choices of, of smoking marijuana or not. 
That nigga got hella muscles. That didn't make me go to the gym and get hella muscles and start knocking niggas out because he got muscles. Right? I mean, that's cool. That's what he do. Right. Uh, look, me, I love LL Cool J. I'm going to put that out there like right now. <laughs> I don't love it. I love listen, cool I'm gonna tell I, you, if I shit, talk shit, shit about you, that means I love you, nigga. No, listen. So shit don't get misconstrued and everything. That's the homie. That's the OG. You know, what I mean? and I and I and I really uh, appreciate this the shit that he's doing right now. As far as like, you know, putting everything on. You know, like everything. Everybody that contributed to the culture, man. He bigs he bigs it up, man. I, I feel I feel like I love how he's watching over. A, a thing that he was like a pioneer and create, you know, the whole deal, you know what I mean? So I don't want to get that twisted and I don't want to get things misconstrued because I know in interviews, you know, there's sound bites and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, KRS-One, BDP, all of all these folks that was mentioned, these are our forefathers of this shit and, and we love them. You know what I mean? I don't want to get nothing twisted or misconstrued or what have you at all. No, oh, uh, Absolutely. And and Trey, for you with uh, liberation in particular, how did you find you able to explore your artistry in a way that you weren't <laughs> able to do as much in the confines of the group? Yo, that's, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that. And man, it was just things that I was going through at that time, and there was just things like maybe things I believed in, you know. And not everybody believes in the same thing or whatever, you know what I mean? And it's like it's not okay to like kind of put my beliefs in my thing whatever i was i was really on some other shit at that time it's not for me to put that on them you know what i mean so liberation was it was me taking off layers of of slim kid trey of trey hartson of all kind of concepts that i grew up like going to church with my, my mom and my grandma and all that that stuff and what i've thought about it you know even since like a little kid i'm like yo that shit ain't for me you know what i mean and just like kind of peeling away all of these layers to find you and then becoming that taking steps forward with that you know what i mean so it was a lot of deep it was a lot of deep uh deep things and deep thoughts and creations and i learned how to play a lot of mushrooms too let's just be real <laughs> a lot of mushrooms and 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 i think i was going through my saturn return as well so i was a lot of life lessons things was uh, popping up for me you know what I mean? And then just like kind of finding myself. And that's just what, what liberation was. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you can't really impose that on anybody else. Well, you, that, that, you know the, re the reason why it's interesting to me is with liberation, humble beginnings and the loneliest punk all around, you know, coming relatively close mm -hmm. to one another or in the same general time period. It's just amazing that the albums, three albums were so different and mm. presented each of you guys yeah. and Booty Brown with humble beginnings, you know, just in such dramatically different ways. So, right. so Fat Lip, once you had heard all three of those albums, like what, how did you, if at all, look at, look at your crew differently or learn anything about them? Um, repeat that question one more time. I, I, oh, I, I wanted to get from Lip here. Oh, okay, those, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. From Lip here in those three uh, albums, what, you kind of thought or learned or saw differently from the crew i you know i gotta be honest like at the time those albums were released i probably didn't think anything because i didn't really start listening to the far side until recently hmm. like seriously like we worked on that album and we had a lot of ambitions and but i never really got a chance to really hear a lot of lyrics from Trey or Imani or Booty Brown. Like, I ne and we never listened to our music at the time when the music was out. So it's like, we got that kind of group. It was always like different. We was with other people. They would be rapping they, they verses and can't wait till they shit come on. It was weird when our music came on, like still to this day for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, and it, no, a lot of the stuff back then, I, I, I didn't really appreciate it. I couldn't really appreciate it. My ear is completely, it's, it's, it's a lot different now. It's a lot more accepting of, a, like Trey would tell you, I wanted the shit to be a certain way, you know? And that's kind of like where me and Trey used to always fall out. You know, like, um, like I, 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 I wanted to be something. 
Like I want, mm. and a lot of times I wanted to be some shit that I was, I, I just wasn't. You know what I'm saying? I like I wanted to be some shit that I wasn't. A lot of times. In the beginning, hip hop was ruled by the East Coast. Then the West Coast rose to prominence thanks to gangster rap. Straight out of Compton, crazy motherfucker named Ice Cube. Hip hop changed the world. Gangster rap changed the narrative. I'm representing for the gangsters all across the world. And then changed the world again. Cause I'll come and take your life away. The history of gangster rap features unheard stories, unseen photos and documents, all with exclusive interviews from the founders and players who shaped gangster rap. I think a real gangster rapper has to scare you a little bit. The history of gangster rap written by veteran rap journalist Soren Baker. In stores now. Yo, what up? This is DJ Quick. Be sure to pick up my homeboy Soren Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap, if you really want to know what we do.